The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life, and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration, and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we sometimes like to call it for short. Tonight's presentation is The Future Ocean. We'll be talking about what's in store for our ocean planet and the future of ocean engineering and ocean science. My name is Veronique LaCapra. I'll be your HUI host for tonight. The ocean is our life support system, and it is changing faster than almost any other part of our planet. What does the future hold for the ocean as these changes continue to play out? And how is technology shaping our ability to better understand, predict, and prevent undesirable changes? Let's find out. Joining us to talk about the future ocean are two leaders in ocean research and exploration. The first is Fabien Cousteau, or as we say in America, Fabien Cousteau. He's an aquanaut, oceanographic explorer, environmental advocate, and founder of the Fabien Cousteau Ocean Learning Center. The second is our own Mark Abbott. Mark is the president and director of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. You'll be hearing from each of them shortly. First, I'd like to take a minute to uh, do one of our polls to get a sense from uh, to get a sense of where people are tuning in from today. If you've joined us on Zoom, uh, you should be seeing a poll pop up on your screen. Um, we'd like you to indicate the region where you're call where you're joining us from. Hui is on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, so I'm guessing quite a few people will be from the northeastern U.S. But if you're from somewhere else, please let us know. The poll choices don't cover everywhere, but just pick the one that's closest to you. While that poll is running, um, I've got some tips here on how you can optimize your Zoom experience with us this evening. Later on, the panelists will be taking questions from all of you. If you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type the question, type your question in the window that appears. Um, you may be more used to the chat function in Zoom, but please use the Q&A button instead. We often get hundreds of questions, literally, so if we don't get to yours while we're live, our goal will be to try to answer them, as many of them as we can, following the program. You can ask questions at any time, starting now. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event, and that recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. We should have our poll results here. They are. So uh, as I predicted, a lot of folks from the Eastern US, but uh, we've got about 17% from uh, the West Coast and um, a handful from overseas. Um, so that's great. Thank you all for participating. All right, let's get started with the main event. First, thank you Fabien and Mark for joining us this evening to tell us about your vision of the future ocean. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. Let's start with Fabien. As the first grandson of Jacques-Yves Cousteau, Fabien spent his early years aboard his famous grandfather's ships, Calypso and Alcyon. To say he started early would be an understatement. On his fourth birthday, he actually learned how to scuba dive. Um, I'm dying to see what those little tanks must have looked like. Uh, Fabien is well known for his study of sharks and has helped produce several TV specials about them, including Ocean Adventures, Attack of the Mystery Shark, and Mind of a Demon, in which he created a 14-foot, 1,200-pound lifelike shark submarine, aptly named Troy, that enabled him to immerse himself inside the world of sharks. In 2014, Fabian and his team of aquanauts embarked off Florida on Mission 31. It was the longest science expedition to take place at Aquarius, the world's only underwater marine laboratory. The success and global reach of Mission 31 set the stage for Fabian's vision for the next generation of underwater habitats that will advance ocean exploration and marine research. I'm sure we'll hear more about that tonight. Fabien, soyez le bienvenu. 
et merci de vous joindre à nous ce soir. Thank you for being here. Merci Véronique, ça fait un grand plaisir. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone who tuned in uh, today. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, uh, to you and your team at Hui for uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, evening. And of course, for all your hard work over in uh, what a beautiful part of the world. And of course, every part of the world that you go to. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, tonight. Um, I think that uh, if, uh, I don't know if I should be uh, manning these slides or uh, if you can see the first slide that's there. Uh, but essentially, uh, this is really indicative of something that uh, really uh, shows a, a human ocean connection. As a, as a aquanaut, uh, as an uh, ocean explorer, uh, I've witnessed a lot of change my entire life. And I remember my grandfather and subsequently my father uh, saying very similar things to the generation coming, which is there are places on the planet uh, that we've explored that I cannot bring my son or my daughter to because they've changed so drastically. And for me, uh, it's the same thing uh, in my life. There are uh, areas of the world that have changed so very much. Uh, and there's a, a question of shifting baselines, of course, which is a uh, a problem of perspectives that we really need to write so that we can make better decisions. But I don't wanna talk about the bad news as much tonight as some of the optimistic news and, and that there's so much left to explore. This uh, planet is an amazing life support system as you've, uh, as you've well pointed out, it is our life support system. Uh, we are well ahead in the slides. I'm not, I'm not, uh, 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 controlling those. So if we could go back one, yeah. Um, that would be um, something that my grandfather said that we, that we really um, could stand to, 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 to learn from, which is a very, very basic thought, which is people protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. And uh, if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. That's a growing up something that infused the multiple generations in our family uh, to really be addicted to ocean, to be um, maybe aware of a place that so many of us may never get a chance to go to. And as such, as explorers, as uh, researchers, as scientists, as uh, engineers that go into that amazing alien space, we have a responsibility to share it with the rest of the world in a way that highlights its importance, uh, its excitement, uh, and the fact that there's so much left out there to be discovered. If we go to the next one. Now, uh, four years ago, I had the opportunity to start a, a nonprofit called the Ocean Learning Center, or for long, the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center. So many times I, I want to say my name. But um, it, it really culminated in uh, the fact that uh, as storytellers, as explorers, uh, we, we do uh, our best to be able to connect people through stories. But for me, it wasn't enough. I wanted to integrate uh, a solution building platform for various communities around the world, including sea turtle restoration with, uh, with uh, women empowerment, uh, 3D coral printing with coral restoration, mangrove uh, restoration for uh, the sake of learning about climate change and uh, the fact that they are great carbon sinks and so on and so forth. But there was one uh, program that I've always wanted to do and it really was influenced by Mission 31, which was uh, the mission that you had uh, highlighted in the beginning. And Mission 31 and all these other programs really highlight uh, facilitating, facilitating research, education, advocacy, and empowerment. But it's really about that human ocean connection and bringing people on a journey that will infuse them with the science all while uh, thrilling them with the adventure that they're having. And Mission 31 uh, was uh, something of a, an awakening for me. My grandfather built some of the first underwater habitats. And previous to that, he had co-invented the Aqualung with Ingenieur Emile Gagnon from Air Liquide. And with that, those tools were instrumental in the beginning of their 
uh, the, their exploits and the exploration in the in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and up into the 90s to highlight the uh, unknown, to highlight this mysterious aquatic world. And even to this day, we've explored less than 5% of our ocean world to date. If you take the 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume that the ocean represents, I'm going to go against the grain for a second and say that my educators growing up were wrong. The ocean doesn't represent 72 or 73 percent of the planet. It represents 99 percent of our world's living space because we forget to count in that third dimension. And so with that said, there's a lot left out there to explore. And there are wonderful technologies that are being used around the world and on platforms and in organizations such as Woods Hole that include uh, state-of-the-art uh, ships and ROVs and submersibles and of course diving equipment and, and all that sort of thing. But one thing that seemed to be missing was an underwater laboratory or platform the way I dreamed of uh, that my grandfather used to do with his team and others. Uh, there's Sea Lab and Hydro Lab and so on. But in our generation, there's only one left, which is Aquarius. And you see a picture of it there. Uh, if we go to the next one, that'd be fantastic. Aquarius is a platform that is a glorious uh, 600 internal square feet within which up to six people live uh, and, and do research from. But the idea is not to be inside the habitat. The idea is really that's a home base that you can sleep in, that you can eat, and then you go out into the water column and become one with your community, with that underwater ecosystem, that underwater city. And as I've noticed over that 31 day period, that ecosystem started accepting us as part of it. And that allowed us to do a lot more advanced research, bringing in some of that technology and bringing it on site as human beings. Um, it, it, it was just a, a, an absolutely fabulous experience that highlighted the importance of human beings and technology melding together in unison to be able to push further, longer, and deeper. Uh, next slide, please. At the end of the day, uh, Mission 31 uh, was there to highlight several things. Uh, one of them is despite the fact that Aquarius at that point was 25 years old, it's now almost 30 years old, uh, it was an unbelievably amazing, unique platform that allowed for us to do over three years worth of scientific research by bringing in various technologies such as the PAM or pulse amplitude modulated fluorometer within which we could test and look at various coral species and their, uh, their vibrancy and, and uh, the, the, the type of um, longevity that they may have on the coral reef, especially when faced with today's uh, issues of climate change, pollution, and so on. Additionally, we were able to go out into the water column, look at uh, various um, species collection from the most small minute bacterium and, and phytoplankton up to the large animals such as this Goliath grouper. Uh, next one, please. Now, uh, I would like to share maybe a 30 second clip, which I'll talk over, of two of my aquanauts that came down with me, my, two of my star scientists, one's an engineer actually at MIT, or was a, an engineer graduate at MIT, uh, Grace, and uh, the other one is Liz from Northeastern. And what we had the, the blessing and privilege of is that two, uh, two MIT engineers had given us two prototypes of a camera called the Edratronic, which was um, a camera that is able to shoot over 20,000 frames a second. And we brought them down very gingerly, hoping not to ruin them in salt water, uh, to be able to shoot the, the high speed camera so that we could look at biomechanics and things that our eyes and regular cameras simply can't pick up. You saw a, a mantis shrimp, for example, missing a goby. Uh, this particular goby is cleaning uh, things out of its hole, uh, uh, sand out of its hole. But all these things give us good insight into a lot of various uh, aspects of data and scientific uh, information co uh, collecting that's quite important. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, another aspect of Aquarius that I found fascinating and really, really useful was that there was better Wi-Fi at the bottom of the sea than my own apartment in New York City. So it was a pleasure to be able to connect to the internet, uh, whether we are inside the habitat or outside the habitat, and connect with over 100,000 students in various parts of the world through Skype in the classroom sessions. And to be able to bring in those people, those young people and young at heart virtually, and show them things that they may never get a chance to see in person. And for me, that's a thrill because as a storyteller, as an adventurer, you're able to really get them in on the action firsthand, or at least virtually speaking. And in today's world, it's uh, obvious that it's even more important to be able to connect with people with communities around the world so that we can inspire them, be they uh, future scientists or be they accountants or something else, so that when they make their daily decisions, they bring in ocean as part of that decision making. Because at the end of the day, our planet is a natural resource bank account, and we need to start living off the interest rather than eating away the capital that it bears. In order to be able to explain that in a way that's empowering to the average person, we need to be able to show how beautiful and unique this place is. Next slide, please. Now, Mission 31 uh, uh, had uh, a, a lot of successes and a lot of challenges. Uh, living 31 days in uh, 600 square feet is a little bit like isolating these days, except in an even smaller uh, space for most of us. Uh, we were able, however, to go out and venture into the water column. Each one of us were able to dive from eight to 10 hours a day uh, before we got exhausted and wanted to come back in. But that allowed us to uh, generate with the, the great help and our partnerships with Northeastern, MIT, uh, FIU, and others, over 12 scientific papers. Uh, we were able to test technologies. We were able to reach uh, out to people. And really, it was about the science and the outreach combined that made, in my mind, uh, made it a, a huge success. But that was just the beginning of the story. Uh, next slide, please. At the end of the day, it made me realize that there is an arrow in our quiver of research and tools and technology that's missing in today's world. And with that, I set off on a path of maybe uh, being called crazy, but really wanting to build the International Space Station underwater as a state-of-the-art platform to add to all the other platforms that we're currently using be it probes or uh, AUVs, uh, gliders, uh, boats, et cetera, et cetera, so that we are able to complement and complete the picture of underwater exploration as we have so much left to do. I, I'm a big believer in uh, the human ocean connection and the, the marriage of human beings and technology to push our research further than we've ever been able to do. <coughs> The, the biggest, uh, for me, the biggest uh, frustration as a scuba diver is uh, the limit of time underwater. And so with ROVs and AUVs and with a platform such as this, we'll be able to stay down much longer and learn much more about this life support system. And at the end of the day, we go back to what my grandfather taught me when I was growing up, which is people protect what they love. They love what they understand and they understand what they're taught. Together, we can look forward to a much better future if we take care of our life support system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabian. That's fascinating stuff. I'm sure we'll hear more about it during the Q&A. Um, before we go to Mark, I'd like to test all of your knowledge about the ocean with another online poll. Our question for you is, what percentage of the world's population lives within 60 miles or just under 100 kilometers of the ocean. What percentage of the world's population lives within 60 miles or just under 100 kilometers of the ocean? I'll give folks a minute here to answer the poll and we should have results any second now. Here we go. Um, so most of you said 80%, really 80% of the world's population uh, 
lives within 60 miles of the coast. Um, the actual answer, according to the United Nations, is 40%. That's still pretty high. 40% of the world's population lives within 60 miles of the ocean. That's 33.2 billion people in 2020. 10%, um, this is really interesting, 10% of people worldwide live on land that is less than 30 feet above sea level. So lots of people uh, potentially at risk with sea level rise. But even if you don't live anywhere near the ocean, um, I would say 100% of us are affected by it every day by uh, things like global climate, for example. Now let's hear from our second guest tonight, Mark Abbott. Mark is the 10th director and president of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He came to Hui in late 2015, and unless we can talk him out of it, he plans to step down from his position at the end of this year. Before joining us at Hui, Mark served for about 14 years as the Dean of Oregon State University's College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. Mark's research focused on the interaction of biological and physical processes in the upper ocean and relied on both remote sensing, so satellites, and field observations. In fact, he was a pioneer in the use of satellite ocean color data to study ocean processes such as plankton blooms and currents. Mark has advised the Office of Naval Research and the National Science Foundation on issues regarding advanced computer technology and oceanography. And he has also advised the federal government on issues of national security and climate change. Mark, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Veronique. And uh, thank you, Fabienne. I hope that uh, your work inspires a lot of our audience the way your grandfather inspired many of us back in the day watching uh, the shows on television, they were really opened up a world. And I think, you know, when we look at this first slide, this is a vision that I've had for gee, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years more, which is an ocean that is less remote and more accessible. An ocean that I like to think of as always on, always connected. Uh, one of the things that uh, Andy Bowen, that some of you may have heard last week, uh, told me a long time ago, he said, you know, one of the problems with being an ocean robot is you don't know where your friends are and you don't know where you are. There's no Wi-Fi and there's no GPS. It's a really harsh, isolated environment, as uh, Fabienne uh, discussed briefly, just particularly for humans, but even for machines. And in many ways, it's a more challenging environment than working in space, where you can at least send radio waves and talk to instruments on the moon or instruments leaving the solar system on spacecraft. If we go to the next slide, uh, one of the things we rely on are ships. These are the, the Woods Hole Oceanographic ships, Neil Armstrong on the right, Atlantis on the left on a, on a nice foggy morning, kind of like what it is like here in Woods Hole. You may occasionally hear the uh, Steamship Authority's ferry boat sound its foghorn. It's a foggy night here. Uh, these are really exquisite ships that take us and really foster that exploration and discovery. We've used ships for over oh, 130 or 40 years around the world to go out, take scientists to see, make measurements, collect samples, and bring them back. If we go to the next slide, and we've taken and developed fabulous instrumentation. Uh, the one on the left, uh, developed by Heidi Sosek here at Woods Hole Oceanographic, actually uses uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to identify hundreds of species of microorganisms. Uh, just can count what's out there, identifying uh, harmful algal blooms or all sorts of species. It's an amazing laboratory in a can. On the right is another instrument uh, developed by Chris Sholin out at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute that actually analyzes DNA samples. It collects water, runs very sophisticated chemical analyses, all in a can. They're, these are built here in uh, Falmouth, Massachusetts. They're revolutionary. But the interesting thing, they're handmade. Uh, they're artisanal in some sense, can't quite buy them on Etsy, but they're like that. They are expensive, they're one-off, they're wonderful. They've opened up huge, windows into the ocean, but you can't get very many of them. If you go to the next slide, so imagine that we wanted to study a forest and we could go out there 
every few years, maybe in a couple of places, the way we do today on research ships. We go on a cruise, maybe we're in a location for three or four weeks, but then we have to come back. So imagine studying a forest that way, and you say, yeah, I could learn a lot about a forest because forests don't change very fast. The trees are always in place. But think about if that forest doubled every day, and what if those trees moved? That's what our phytoplankton are doing in our ocean. That biomass has a doubling time. Most of it gets consumed uh, every day by micro animals, right? microscopic zooplankton. But that's the thing that we're trying to study, an ecosystem that is changing much faster than we can sample it. If we go to the next slide, Walter Monk, who lived over 101 years, called the 20th century, the century of undersampling of the ocean. We're 20 years into the 21st century, and we're still undersampling this ocean. We can't study the ocean on the time and space scales that it's changing. So if we go to the next slide, this is where we're struggling. As Fabienne mentioned, there's a lot of change underway. You can read about it in the newspaper, see it on TV, watch it on, learn about it on the internet, be it microplastics or sea level rise or coral reef ecosystems or shifts in fisheries. We're so constrained by how we can study and observe and measure the ocean. We're really into what I like to call detect and repair. We found something wrong, let's go fix it. If we could go and study the ocean on its scales, could we begin to understand and make predictions and prevent these changes? Could we be better stewards of the ocean and actually be data-driven rather than occasionally we get measurements? Just think about self-driving cars around cities uh, around the world. They live with sensors all, on their vehicles and all around them so that they can understand their environment, respond to it, avoid problems and make much better decisions. We need to be a data-driven steward of our ocean planet. If we go to the next slide, over the last 15, 20 years, the nations of the world have deployed as a whole series of profilers represented by these black dots that are tracking the weather in the ocean. It's, again, revolutionized our understanding of ocean circulation. But even though it looks like there are a lot of dots there, they're equivalent of having two weather stations in the state of Nebraska. Maybe that's okay for Nebraska for our people from the Midwest, but we all know that weather changes on much smaller scales and that's we're way undersampling the ocean. We're still struggling to understand how it's changing so we can understand it. Go to the next slide. Many of you have seen uh, satellite data. I clearly worked on that when I was out at Jet Propulsion Lab and Scripps years ago, working a lot on the satellite on the left. That was uh, Terra, NASA's Earth observing system, the first satellite. It's still up there running. Uh, you can see the people standing there in the clean room. Uh, that satellite took 10 years to design and build, $1 billion. And that's great. It makes those wonderful measurements at advanced ocean instrumentation or Earth remote sensing instrumentation enormously. But then on the right, we have what satellites from Planet Labs out in San Francisco. They make these little, based on CubeSats, launched hundreds of them. Uh, they call them doves. So they actually have flocks of these satellites. And they're launching every three to four months. They're constantly revolutionizing. They're much more like your iPhones in terms of upgrading the capabilities and performance of those satellites versus once every 10 years, a billion dollars. So we're starting to see those kinds of changes happen in Earth remote sensing, why not the ocean? It's not just a matter of making it cheaper. We wanna be much more flexible and agile and take advantage of changes in technology and changes in knowledge. We need to measure this more carefully because we understand it. We want to be able to think of a new kind of sensor on Friday, build it on Monday, deploy it on Wednesday. Get into that much more nimble uh, agility uh, that's hard to do in the ocean. If we go to the next slide. Those of you who've grown up in computers, you know, when I was uh, just born in the early 1950s, 
the ENIAC computer there on the left, and those women are actually programming the computing. They're not there just as demonstrations. They were actually coding. Uh, that computer, the chip that you could would need to build to be a, the equivalent of the computational power is would be tiny compared to the chip on the right in an iPhone 11. But it's interesting, it's not just smaller and cheaper. What makes an iPhone or any smartphone powerful is that it's connected. It's connected as part of a larger network, either a social network or a sensor network. You can even look at what Apple and Google are talking about in terms of contact tracing for COVID-19. The power comes from the connectivity as much as from the individual device. Uh, those of us old enough to remember a device from Apple called the iPod, it would have just been another MP3 player, except on the backside was something called iTunes, which allowed podcasts and musicians and independent artists to place their content into a larger network. If we go to the next slide, we're beginning to see some of these things appear in the ocean. So on the, on the left, is a autonomous vehicle called from subsea sail out in San Diego, California. It can actually surface, uh, talk to a satellite network and then submerge itself. Uh, it's autonomous, it can talk to the GPS network, communicate with satellites, make measurements and act as a data relay system. On the lower right are larger surface uh, autonomous vehicles from sail drone out in Alameda, California another communication network that can traverse the oceans and make autonomous measurements. And then in the upper right from so far, uh, their spotter device uh, funded by DARPA and Office of Naval Research, working with surfers to deploy these instruments around the coastal ocean. Uh, low cost sensors beginning to think about getting to that connectivity, the intelligence within the individual devices glimmerings of that always on, always connected ocean. Next slide shows what that can begin to enable us to do. So I worked with a group of 13 uh, MIT mechanical engineering uh, undergraduate students the past six months, gave them a problem, said, what if you could take those profilers, like the, that global map, those Argo profilers, those weather stations, make them smaller, make them able to profile much faster, maybe, Act, uh, allow them with fins to be able to move horizontally uh, and be able to deploy a thousand of them in a box in the ocean, you know, uh, 60 miles by 60 miles by 3,000 feet deep to really go out and make ecological and physical measurements and understand how an ecosystem might be changing. Gave them that task, pretty broad. And then on the next slide, the kids here on the left work together over four, six months, or so 13 of them, about then you could say six years of experience. They came and presented their initial design late last February to 15 Huey engineers and scientists, collectively maybe two centuries of experience in building underwater vehicles. And the scientists here and engineers were quite impressed with the innovation, the new ways of thinking because they uh, weren't encumbered with the ocean is hard and we've got to build it in a certain way. Uh, they came in and really came up with some amazing new technologies. Of course, the pandemic hit and they, came, they were able to visit Woods Hole and then a week later, MIT shut down. And so then on the right, everything from then on was done via Zoom. Uh, but what they did was find not only did they work differently and have new ideas, they collaborated in new ways. That sort of global network of people. And they actually, for you geeks in the audience, you know there's something called a sort of a platform, a framework as it were, that you can plug in new capabilities. If you have a piece of software, you could go into an app store, add it into an Apple ecosystem. You don't have to reinvent everything. There's a lot of that framework out there. These kids started developing in that way. And what that does is start to open up a window into how we're going to make technology innovation more democratized, 
more accessible, that's going to lead to that always on, always connected ocean. And it's an always on, always connected people and innovation network as much as a sensor network. That opens it up, makes the ocean not just the domain of scientists going to sea on big ships, making wonderful instrumentation. It will continue to be the backbone of a lot of what we do, but there's a new world emerging. But I hope we always remain to have that, that wonderful experience to get to sea sometime and watch the sunset over the ocean. So thank you very much. Back to you, Veronique. All right, thank you, Mark. Now, before we open things up for audience questions, we're going to do another quick poll. Um, and our question this time is, if the ocean were a country, how would its gross domestic product rank compared to other countries worldwide? So imagine the ocean is a country. How would its GDP, its gross domestic product, rank compared to all the other countries worldwide? And we'll give folks a little time to answer, since uh, this probably isn't something most people think about most of the time. It's kind of an interesting question. All right, I think we're going to see our results here. They are. OK, so uh, more than half of you thought it would rank first. Um, but about uh, about a third of you said seventh, and that is the correct answer. Uh, the ocean would rank seventh. So the gross marine product, as it were, or the total value of goods and services provided by the ocean in a single year is more than 2.5 trillion US dollars. If the ocean were a country, it would rank seventh. It would Its economy would be larger than that of Brazil or Russia. So that's pretty amazing. All right, uh, let's uh, get started with questions. And I actually have one for Fabien. Fabien, you said people would think you were crazy for wanting to build this international station underwater. But um, but I actually have a sort of the flip side of that as a question. Um, so the, the first moonwalk was in 1969, as we saw in that Proteus uh, video. That same year, the first undersea human occupied habitat, it was called Tektite One, was created off the coast of Florida. Why has it taken 50 years, more than 50 years, for someone such as yourself to move forward with establishing an undersea international station like the space station in Earth's orbit? Well, all crazy ideas come with a lot of complications, obviously. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, to quickly comment on your poll uh, about the, uh, the GDP of the ocean. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of debate on this, uh, of course, in the, the finer points of it, but to, to me, the ocean is invaluable. And although we're trying to put a number, a physical number on it, without ocean, there is no such thing as human beings. And without a healthy ocean, there's no such thing as a healthy future. So it, it's a bit of a misnomer to say it's the seventh largest economy because it brings us so many more things that are intangibles, well-being, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we are not counted. Now, to answer your question about uh, uh, Proteus or any habitat, the first habitat was actually, the, there's a difference between a shelter and a habitat, and that, that's been the argument in the past, but the first actual habitat was built in 1961 off of Marseille called Conchelf 1, or Precontinent 1, followed by Tektide and Conchelf 2 and Sea Lab and Hydro, you know, a lot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, the point is that human beings, um, have physiological and psychological limits. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's an aspect of that that as we look into space exploration and colonization, we also must look at uh, the same kind of colonization, uh, temporary or not underwater. Uh, secondarily, technology uh, is finally catching up to a point where now we can offer a platform that is modern, that is uh, highly sophisticated, integrated with all sorts of technologies, working with all those various platforms that Mark uh, had covered, uh, and to be able to uh, have underwater labs whereby people don't stay down there for days and weeks, but now we can stay for weeks and possibly months or longer. That was uh, simply not the case before. Materials weren't there. The technology just wasn't there. Uh, submarine docking stations weren't perfected, et cetera, and so on. So um, I look forward to uh, building something that is not 600 internal square feet, but is capable of 
being the size of an American home uh, and housing 12 people and being able to have state-of-the-art labs where we can do that research on site in real time as the data comes in from those various platforms and to complement the platforms that are already in existence today. So kind of as a two-part follow-up, do, do you think we'll actually be able to do that in five to 10 years or, or what time frame, frame do you envision? And then we have a question from Jim who says, what areas of research might benefit the most from a long-term human presence in the ocean? Well, those are all very good and very valid questions and debates, of course, as well. Um, if we had if we had the funding today, uh, we could have built it. We could have built it yesterday uh, with today's technology. Uh, it's not. Uh, it, it's a proven uh, platform over the years and over the decades, and we can build on all the amazing uh, breakthroughs and research that have been done in the past from the dozen and a half habitats in history, uh, and we can address all the shortcomings and weaknesses by creating a space that is conducive to all those wish lists that were never fulfilled before. Uh, as far as uh, the kinds of research, look at what we're facing today with pandemics. Imagine uh, being able to be down at the bottom of the sea, this, this wild frontier, really, even in places that are presumably fairly well explored like certain coral reefs, and to be able to look at microorganisms so we can extract some of those chemical compositions to find treatments and cures for things like pandemics, things like uh, uh, cancer or uh, pain mitigation. Some of those things already exist today. We're just scratching the surface. This is our next uh, rainforest, if you will. And it's a great anecdote for those of us who may want to explore and colonize space down the road because it's a, it's a great test bed for that sort of isolation, that sort of extreme environment, and to be able to uh, go through the physiological and psychological parameters and limitations that would need to be integrated into those space colonies. All right, so uh, this one is for, for Mark. Um, ben points out that collaboration is key to new discoveries and, and moving forward. Um, and this also relates to, to having a space station-like structure under the water. But um, how do you think uh, the future of, how do you see the future of international collaboration in ocean science, Mark? Well, it's that's a great question, Ben. And you know, the international aspect has always kind of been there in the ocean sciences. Uh, certainly it started with individual nations, the United Kingdom launching the Challenger expedition in the late 19th century. But fairly soon, you know, by the mid 20th century, there were a lot of big international programs that's still out there. Uh, in fact, we're doing a, a lot here at Woods Hole Oceanographic with uh, Europe, South America, Africa, Asia. Uh, I think it's become maybe a more problematic if you read the headlines over the last few years. Uh, I think that there's still, because it is a global resource, because it isn't owned by anybody, although they're clearly ec exclusive economic zones, the opportunities for international collaboration there are just as, as good, and I would argue, no offense to some of my space exploration cattle, colleagues, but more important or more pressing for the planet than maybe going to space. Certainly International Space Station has shown uh, a lot of ways that nations can collaborate, even when there are tensions in other areas. I would like to see the ocean read as that kind of platform, that venue where we can bring nations together because it is an ocean planet. So it's, I, I think that there is international collaboration now and I can only see it growing. So we're doing a good job with international collaboration when it comes to ocean engineering and science. How do we engage a more diverse range of people to bring a richer set of experiences and insights to oceanography here at home? And, and to follow on that, do you see oceanography as a field here in the United States becoming more diverse and inclusive in the future? And how do we as an oceanographic community make that happen? Yeah, that again, it's a, you know, it used to be viewed as a fairly exclusive view. Most people didn't know about the ocean. And even though they might live near the ocean, unless you were right on the beach, you know, it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. It seemed remote. It was yachts and people with a lot of money. That 
has really changed a lot because a lot of the schools, both K through 12 and at higher education are beginning to offer uh, more sort of ocean opportunities in terms of research. It's interesting and in my experience with the, the students at MIT, there's the cool factor in the ocean. I mean, weird organisms and it's just, you know, and it's beautiful. There's that importance that gets people hooked. Wow, I'm seeing these changes. And there's that impact and opening up that technology universe to say, you can bring a technology that might've been developed for completely different purpose, machine learning, and develop something that really revolutionizes our understanding of the ocean. If you could do that more quickly and not say, gee, I've got to wait many years and I'll get my crews or my time on a satellite. You know, you can look, it just opens it up. So one of the examples is to look at the CubeSat program. You know, there are high school classes now that are building satellites and getting them launched by NASA. When I was growing up, that going to space was something that was done in NASA centers or, you know, in the military or whatever. It's been democratized. The technology has opened that up. If you want to work on a computer, you went to a university or a national lab. You're carrying it around in your pocket now. So my sense is that the technological opportunities are opening that, those vistas up and the education is beginning to catch up. We're starting to see at Woods Hole Oceanographic our partnerships with undergraduate institutions or with MIT. It really is bringing a much broader and richer and more diverse group a population of ideas and people into the field. So I, it, it's becoming open. It's not a country club. All right, I have a related question from uh, Carolyn who teaches middle school in Massachusetts and uh, a similar question from Jane who teaches high school in Tampa. And they're both asking, uh, what advice would you give students who, who want to work in oceanography, who want to help save our oceans, or who are just curious about the ocean, um, but maybe don't live nearby, don't have access to those opportunities? How, how do we go about opening the door for them? And uh, either one of you could answer that. I'll turn to Fabien, because he's done it the most. But go ahead, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll chime in. But I'll let the our guests go first. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, it's really about empowerment and being able to engage those those individuals who want to do something and to become leaders in their communities. Uh, don't wait. Do it. Look around for uh, for help, whether it's for your teachers or your or your parents or your community to uh, to build a a program or to build a solution for something that you feel is is important and something that is very concerning, whether it be, say, for example, plastic pollution, or whether it be something else, uh, overconsumption of a natural resource such as uh, sea life. Uh, most people call it seafood, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, because what happens in on our planet as a closed loop system happens to the ocean. What happens to the ocean happens to us. So if you happen to be near a water body, because remember, this is a circulatory system, right? Lakes and streams and rivers feed into the ocean. And of course, it circulates back and feeds back into the loop. So whatever happens upstream inevitably goes into the ocean and inevitably affects us in fundamental ways, including, of course, if you go to the supermarket nowadays, and I hate to, to scare people, but you're talking about a, a, approximately 50% of the seafood, especially the fish that you can find at a supermarket, even a high-end one like a Whole Foods, is riddled with microplastics because of what's happening upstream. And so as a, as a, as a child, uh, maybe, uh, or as a young person growing up, or maybe as a young at heart, if you want to be able to install solar panels on the school, or if you want to create a recycling program, uh, those are starters. Those are, are, are beginners that you can do at home without having to migrate to that seashore. If you happen to be privileged enough to be on the seashore, then you have other options and opportunities as well from beach cleanups and so on. But let's remember that things like beach cleanups are really um, not the solution. They are literally uh, cleaning up the problem at its final destination. We need to clean up our act at the source. And that comes from our everyday decisions. 
And that's really where we have to put our thinking caps on, uh, whether we're educators or, or the students uh, who are, you're leading, and to figure out how to address the root source in our homes and in our communities so that it doesn't get out like a Pandora's box. So. Well, actually, uh, I've got a good question to follow up on that. You mentioned plastics, um, and we've had a number of questions about plastics and ocean acidification and warming. What do each of you see as the most significant problem facing the ocean uh, and the ocean of the future, and, and what can we do about it? So, okay, I'll, since I made Papi Yang go first the last time, I also just wanted to do a little bit of follow-up to the two teachers who asked the Absolutely, question. Mark. Uh, dedicated teachers and parents, you know, there's a lot of material out on the web that you can teach courses, but I'll give one specific example. Uh, the National Ocean Sciences Bowl has been run by the Consortium for Ocean Leadership for the last gee, 15 years or so. It's geared towards high school students, but they, they get, it's amazing the last few years winners have been from landlocked states. These are kids that sometimes they answer questions that I've seen PhD oceanographers struggle to answer. They get really engaged. It really brings it in. There is more material out there. There's more access. There's more real time data that people can see. And so I think the opportunities are emerging, but at the end of the day, it's the teacher in the classroom or the parent at home that really creates that motivation. In terms of the biggest changes, wow, there is a lot going on. I, you know, sea level rise and ocean acidification and plastics make the news and the headlines, and they certainly are, this isn't going to diminish that, but I think one that we sometimes forget that as an ecologist, that's how I was trained out in California, um, is really how we're changing the structure of the ecosystems, be, there, be it through harvest or destruction of habitats or, or whatever. We're seeing really fundamental shifts in the composition of ecosystems and the health of the ecosystem. And it's more than just overfishing, that's part of the issue, but you know, I, I wonder about how healthy the ocean's gonna be, particularly as we turn to it more and more for a source of protein. You know, it's, we're asking a lot of our ocean and we're asking a lot of the ecosystem. And I would say that's a problem that's, it's been realized, but it may be more profound than we've given, than we thought about. Fabienne, did you wanna add to that? Sure. I mean, you know, it, it's always a, a topic that uh, uh, concerns me as well as really pulls at my emotional strings. And, and, and Mark was, was very eloquent in answering that. Uh, for me, when we look at the, the, the planet as a whole and our consumption rate as individuals, uh, not only have we wiped clean almost 60% of our world's wild fish stocks, over the last few decades, but on top of which we're dumping over 300 million metric tons per year of plastic and other debris, mostly plastic. As far as the plastics concerned, it's a very complicated issue. The simple answer, of course, is stop using single-use plastics. That's it, it, you know that's it's easier said than done, but that that's something we should definitely address as individuals. It makes it more complicated in a situation such as this pandemic, where now you know. Uh, being uh, uh, sanitized and making sure that, that the virus doesn't transfer from one to another, single use anything is an easy solution to try and mitigate that. The problem with plastics is it's, it's a number of different kinds of materials. The biggest problem with plastics is not in their use, if they're used properly, but it's in some of the core materials and chemistry that's inside them, including using fossil fuels. Uh, which transfer and, uh, into chemical compositions that really, um, at the end of the day, poison uh, our future and the future of the food web. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, but at the end of the day, I think what we need to remember is that there is no throwing something away. Away does not exist. It's a fallacy. It's a sales tool to sell you stuff that you don't need. This is a closed loop system. Whatever you're throwing back into that system will end up haunting you down the road. And that's something we have to think about. So related to that, actually, uh, one of our greatest challenges 
uh, asks this person, seems to be making that critical translation from research and exploration to policy and legislation. What can individuals do to ensure that the ocean remains in the minds of business and political leaders? Do you want that one, Mark? <laughs> I'll take a start at that. I think, you know, the, clearly, you know, the power of persuasion and votes that always plays a role in that. But I think the other side, and, you know, sometimes maybe I get a little into trouble on this, but it is to recognize that the ocean is, is really an economic engine in a lot of ways. And I, I understand, Fabien, it's more than just the money, but when people understand that there are impacts on their livelihood, they start making better decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one where, and it's interesting talking to Peter Thompson, who's the special ambassador for the oceans to the UN Secretary General, uh, trying to, you know, we were supposed to have a the kickoff meeting for the UN Decade of Ocean for Science for Sustainable Development. He really emphasizes that we're now moving into an era of partnership with the ocean. It's not just government and academic scientists anymore. It's government, academia, the non-governmental organizations, philanthropy, and the commercial sector, that we've got to bring everybody together on this. It's not just scientists continue to have to explore the frontiers and to raise issues that we never understood, but they also have to work with the people who have to make a living or manage an ocean to really enable better stewardship. Sometimes, you know, I like to do the science that I like to do, but sometimes I'm not answering the right questions. That, that sometimes the people who are trying to make an ocean don't know the right questions. And so we got to come together, this, what they like to call in the policy world, the co-creation of knowledge, where mm -hmm. it's a much more active partnership, not just scientists saying, we're not just experts here, go do this, because the science is changing and the needs change. So we, we've got to have a much more effective dialogue and forum where we can bring those groups together. And I think that's really Peter Thompson's vision that he always lays out that it's, it's all about partnerships moving into the future on the ocean. It's not just, it's not just a regulatory approach. No, I absolutely agree with you, Mark, uh, and, and uh, full heartedly. And, you know, in, in the past, traditionally, uh, science and policy and uh, communities were siloed. And within those, there were silos as well. As different communities of scientists didn't work with others and so on and so forth. So they, the, the, the key to addressing all of this in, in, a, in, a, in, in a full fashion is to have everyone working together in unison for a, a much better common solution. In the past, what's been the main problem is that Oceans were used and abused, used as endless resources and garbage can, as an endless resource and a garbage can, and there was no line item in the balance sheet for the impact that that had. And so now we're paying that price, or we're paying the the borrowing of that that time and and um, resource back. So it's costing us a little bit of money. But at the end of the day, you're uh, you know I'm a hundred percent agree. People have to live. People have to make a living. They have to keep a shelter, uh, shelter and, 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 and be healthy and, and protect their family and so on. And so to be able to find solutions, looking at young people and, and industries uh, and encouraging them to find those alternate solutions to live more in balance, live with the planet rather than on the planet is absolutely key. And that's why institutions such as Woods Hole and others have uh, a key role to play to educate the rest of us in order to be able to have better data sets to work from. I could just give a follow on to that because you got me thinking, Fabien. You know, one of the projects here at Woods Hole Oceanographic is the Ocean Twilight Zone. And that was funded by a group of philanthropers under the Audacious Project, part of TED, uh, helped lead that. And Heidi Sosek is the principal investigator, and its real option, real mission is to understand a resource that we don't understand much, the deep ecosystems that live in the dark waters, you know, 600 feet to 3,000 feet deep, that are maybe about ready to be exploited, but 
not just do it from a science, but can we bring the policy, the technology, the science and the engagement, get people to come in along that voyage of discovery with us so that we can understand a resource before we begin to exploit it and then go, uh-oh, we want to really bring that knowledge and engagement together all at the same time as a network of knowledge, not just a, a single pipeline as you move down the chain, because you get down to the end and you say, man, I wish I hadn't done that. You know, we don't want to get to that point. <laughs> It's much more efficient and much more cost effective to avoid the problem in the first place than having to fix it later. And yep. in order to look at the lessons of, of our history on land, let's not repeat those in the ocean. Yep. We're, we're talking about the ocean's future and I wanna make sure we get to some of the questions we've gotten from uh, younger folks who are watching. Uh, we have a, a question, uh, this is, uh, sounds like it's a question that both Ben, age seven, and Daniel, age five, wanted to know uh, how many animals live in the ocean and how many have you studied? We'll give that to Fabien. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> about oh, how many have you seen? Look how I skirt this one a little bit. Um, I, I'm going to first say uh, that I'm not a scientist. I am an impresario of scientists, as my grandfather used to say. And I work with people who are experts in their fields because I can learn a lot from them. And together, we make a, 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 an interesting team to further that kind of research. And those, those people that spend their and dedicate their lives to doing the research and bringing back all that very valuable data and science, whether it's through technology or through uh, through going out in the field themselves, uh, or both, uh, is of paramount importance. Uh, as far as the amount of, of life that's in the sea, I'm going to say it's 95% of the world. You know, <laughs> there, there's a lot left that hasn't been discovered. And I, I would venture to think that most people would have a hard time answering that question. As far as what we've studied, yeah. We first and foremost, our team uh, are a, a team of explorers and we bring scientists who in that particular field, whether it's the Amazon River, whether it's the deep ocean, whether it is the Red Sea, uh, whether it's uh, the Caribbean, uh, have expertise in the subject matters that we're filming as uh, storytellers. And uh, we, we try and, and tell their story so that we can bring it to a larger audience. The number of subjects, uh, the Amazon River, I'll just take one example. Uh, we spent 11 months in the Amazon River as a team of uh, 16 people. And we studied 69 subjects during that time, including uh, the species of catfish that uh, the, the catalog grew from. Uh, I think it was 200 species back in the day that my grandfather went 20 years prior to over 2,000 species when we went there. So there's, uh, that was just one of the subject matters. But um, I, I don't know how to, uh, how to count the things that we've looked at, but uh, it's a lot. It's hundreds. Let, let me hundreds. ask you both. I want each of you to answer this, but let me ask you a slightly different question. What's your favorite animal oh, that you've easy. ever personally <laughs> seen? Go ahead. For me, the, ahead, my favorite Fabian. invertebrate is the octopus. I just love those creatures. They're so smart. Uh, I, I remember, uh, I don't know if we have time, but I, I, I'll just do it quickly. When I was a kid on Calypso growing up on, and we were on expedition, I remember the scientists having an, an octopus in one tank and crust, uh, uh, lobsters in another and a bunch of fish and so on and so forth. And the lights went out, we all went to bed. The next morning, the crustaceans were all eaten and the octopus was in its tank and the other thing. And the, the scientists thought it was the crew messing with his research. And so he put more lobster in the tank, put lids on all the, the tanks, put a camera system to watch and monitor all night long. And he found out that it was the octopus that slithered out of his tank, opened the, the lid, got into the other tank, which was another table away, got in there, ate, and then went back into his tank, in his own tank. When he could have easily it. gone into the gunnel. My, my summary of that is how amazing and how intelligent is that creature to teach human beings to feed it for free? <laughs> <laughs> They're smart. They're really smart. Mark, what's your favorite animal? Uh, that I've actually studied? <laughs> um, uh, 
<laughs> doesn't have to be. What's your favorite sea creature? I have to agree with Fabienne. I mean, I every time I watch or learn something about octop octopi and how smart they are, and particularly the variety, particularly when you look at some of the deep sea ones that people have just only recently discovered, they're just amazing. I mean, what they're able to do. I think we're just scratching the surface. So it isn't just because Fabien said that, it's that, that was my answer by that. Well, I've never studied them, but you'll let <laughs> Sorry, me Mark, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> but I gotta say, no. uh, it's a good thing they don't live a long time or they would have been the apex predator on this planet. We would we yeah. would have been uh, their, their food source. <laughs> So we're getting close to needing to wrap up, but I want to get in just a couple more questions. Um, Fabien, I'd like to hear more about uh, Proteus. If there's any more sort of details you can tell us about that, or if there's a website we can go to find out more, um, I'm really intrigued by that. Well, so there's some details on the uh, Ocean Learning site, which is uh, fabiancousteauolc.org. I don't know if you can put it up somewhere um, later on on the, on the sure. site. But, um, It'll give you some basics, but essentially it builds, as I mentioned, on all the, the, the wonderful work that's been done in the past few decades of ocean habitats and uses and leverages today's technology to address the shortcomings in the past, including being able to bring in a larger team to do more extensive research for longer periods of time. And that, uh, that addresses some of the physiological and psychological uh, uh, parameters, as well as being able to have 3D printers to create or fix technology on site, as well as being able to go beyond aquanaut limitations, which is saturation diving limitations, uh, which includes maybe having uh, an ROV deployment area and having a, a docking station for a small submarine to be based out of there to go beyond the thousand foot limit or 600, 800 foot limit uh, so that we can really extend ourselves within that, that platform for mid and long-term research. Now, that said, Proteus is just the first of a series of habitats that's planned for deployment in different parts of the world so that you have a network to be able to, uh, to work from and to have data gathering for all the various types of research that would be in there. Now, it wouldn't be just my team. It would actually be truly an international space station where various organizations, maybe Huey, hey, maybe some of you guys want to come with us uh, down there to be able to uh, really offer that platform to organizations and, um, and, and uh, um, universities, as well as individuals who may never otherwise get a chance to use such a platform for very uh, important work that they're doing. So we're really, uh, we're really excited to be able to uh, move forward and, and build that. All right, so to close, I wanna to get to this question. Several people are asking how they can remain hopeful in times of great change and with all these threats to the ocean. Uh, what keeps both of you hopeful about the ocean's future? Oh, I'll, I'll say two things. One is I think we're on the cusp of a real technology revolution that's going to open it up. It's going to demystify the ocean. It's going to enable a lot more people to participate in seeing the ocean and developing tools around the ocean. But I think the other is a greater awareness and understanding that with knowledge, as Fabian sort of said, as his grandfather pointed, with knowledge comes an awareness of our responsibility and, and an ability now to be better stewards, that it isn't just this mysterious, mindless, unpredictable, well, it happened. You know, that there's an ability to recognize that we have some ability to change behaviors, change, perform, change how we do things and help the ocean live. Just, you know, if you look at farming and yeah, there've been things that aren't been great about it, but a lot of farmers recognize they're there for not themselves, but future generations. They take care of the land. They understand the environment. We're getting to that point around the ocean that we understand that we're not just there one and done. Fabien? 
Mark said it so eloquently. I mean, it, it, we're in a, in, a, in a technological revolution where with these little devices in our hands, we can reach anyone in the world practically. And having that kind of global network gives us the ability to exchange information, uh, hopefully in an empowering way, in, in very short order, which was never available in my grandfather's generation. And so between that and the amazing inventive ways that young people today are engaging and not letting themselves be beaten down by the bad news, but really taking it on as a challenge. So, okay, fine, let's roll up our sleeves, let's get, let's figure this out, is extraordinarily energizing to see. And hope, uh, there's a lot of hope out there. You know, nature has a great propensity to heal itself if you give it a break, if you give, uh, if you create these these uh, uh, hope spots, as Sylvia says, or if you uh, put uh, areas that are just uh, off limits to re give rebirth to that area. I think we have a combination of, of uh, approaches into a commonality that will really benefit our future and the globe to really be able to give back to our future generations what we've taken for granted. And I'm really excited, I really am, because today's world is starting to get tuned in to the fact that this is a little oasis in space and the water part of our planet is what makes life possible and what makes life uh, uh, feasible for the future and what makes life so unbelievably enjoyable and blessed for us all. All right, I think that's a great place to end it. Uh, we did not get to everyone's questions by any means, but, but as I said earlier, we will try to do our best to answer as many as we can afterwards. Um, before anyone signs off, if Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is new to you and you'd like to find out more about us, please stay with us for just a few more minutes. We've got a short film that will introduce you to some of our engineers and scientists and some of the fascinating work that they are doing. Uh, but before we show that film, I want to say a big merci to Fabien Cousteau and Mark Abbott for sharing your insights with us. It's been a remarkable and inspiring evening, and we look forward to seeing how your visions for the future play out. Uh, thank you also to all my HUI colleagues who've been working very hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. And to all of you out there, thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please tune in again next week, Wednesday, June 3rd at 7.30 p.m. for our next Ocean Encounters virtual event. Uh, that one, as you can see there, is Corals in Crisis, How Scientists Are Racing to Stop a Deadly Disease. Our special guest uh, next week is going to be marine biologist, ocean explorer, and conservationist Sylvia Earle. Uh, joining her will be coral disease ecologist Marilyn Brandt from the University of the Virgin Islands and Hui Marine Microbial Ecologist Amy April. So please join us for that. Looking ahead, uh, also save the date for our June 10th Ocean Encounters presentation when we'll take you beyond planet Earth uh, with a discussion about oceans on other worlds in our solar system. We'll have NASA astrobiologist Kevin Hand who will join HUI researchers Julie Huber and Chris German, along with special guest, comedian Eugene Merman. You may know him as the voice of Gene on the Emmy award-winning animated series, Bob's Burgers. Registration for that event will start soon, so keep an eye out on the hui.edu website for that. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you again to everyone and enjoy our short film. Merci à tous et passez une bonne fin de soirée. Au revoir. The oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of the earth, life, everything is connected. We are all linked in our research by our passion for the ocean. Hui is an amazing place full of extraordinary people who are truly curious about the ocean, want to understand how it works. How it interacts with the rest of the planetary systems, how humans influence it. The physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the interaction with human society, it's all connected. What HUI does is it brings all those scientists together. The world's best talent in ocean sciences. We learn from each other, we develop opportunities together. It's a fourth multiplier. It feels like 130,000 scientists. I can pull together a team from either my department or other departments at HUI to really tackle any problem. 
Having all the support is what makes HUI unique and enables me to do good science. HUI is at the cutting edge of that mix between science and engineering and it allows us to ask questions that most other places can't ask. You can come up with ideas, put them into action and actually deliver results all in a short time frame. Vehicle technology, AUV technology, seafloor instrumentation, sensor development. You get the world-class reputation, but you've also got amazing ships and engineering that allow you access to places that most other scientists can't get to. You can see further, you can go further, you can reduce your risk, and you can do it less expensively. It's really amazing for me to be able to walk out of my lab, cross the street, and get on to the research vessel that can take me anywhere around the world. I've been to remote reefs in the Maldives and the Micronesia. I've dived on both the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the East Pacific Rise, and very few people have actually been down there and seen that. We looked at these turbulent storms in the ocean and how they create upwellings and nutrients. We're able to collect samples and see how these systems change in real time. Just imagine you are diving, you are reaching the bottom of the sea mount. All of a sudden you see a cloud. As we get closer, we see these objects that were aggregated like in a mass, and you say, what is that? The sense of isolation, you can almost feel the ocean closing over your head as you submerge. You can learn a tremendous amount just by being in the environment. Some things have struck me in the middle of the night. It clicks and you're like, oh my gosh, this is something really huge. It's that aspect of discovery, finding out something new, something that's never been seen before, creates an incredible drive within Huey scientists, and engineers, and technicians. It's such a compelling place to be so dynamic and so many opportunities that it attracts really smart and dedicated students and young scientists. So I was reading those papers about amazing science that was coming out of Hui. Now that I'm here, I get to actually interact with the people who wrote those papers. The positive feedback and the collaboration finally made me decide, oh, I want to be a scientist. Oh, I can be a scientist. It's incumbent on us to perpetuate the cycle of education and research and discovery. People all over the world need to recognize the role that the ocean plays in their daily life. Even if they don't live near the coast, it affects weather, it affects food resources, it affects climate. The tides are changing, the temperature is changing, the salinity is changing. Climate change and overfishing are the biggest threats to coral reefs right now. How will the ocean respond to global warming? We have to understand our planet in order to be good stewards of it. We need to get the understanding into the hands of everyone from the general public to people responsible for making policy decisions. It's probably more important now than it ever was. We're very eager to provide answers for those critical questions that we must address now, and we have the tools and the means to provide these answers. This is the best place on the planet to do the sorts of things that we're doing. Institutions around the world look to Hui as a leader in pushing the envelope. Concepts that were developed here are understood as the basis for oceanography all over the world. I'm proud to be from Hui. There's no place on Earth I'd rather be. We have the potential to change the world. It's not just about this planet, it's about life in the broadest possible terms.